Okay, that looks like we're there. Okay, good luck everyone. I'm going to click start webinar now and you should see the participant numbers starting to rise. So good luck and see you soon. Good afternoon, everyone. We're just waiting for everyone to get accepted into the meeting. And we'll kick off in a few moments. I can't actually see how many of the attendees we have. Could someone who can tell me? Yeah, we're up to uh, 42 people here now. Okay, we'll kick off then. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the latest in the webinar on the SBF UK Climate Resilience Programme. Um, my name's Simon Brown. I'm from the Met Office, and I'll be hosting today's event. Um, we're going to have this is our program for the day at the beginning there's a, just a little bit of news from the resilience program of events that you might be interested in um, and then uh, soon after that we'll be at uh, we'll have our main talk from david sexton and nick leach um, examples generating samples of extreme winters to support climate adaptation and today we have nigel arnell uh, giving a response and then there will be a Q&A a session um, where the panel will respond. <clears throat> so our speakers today are David Stexon is a, a science manager from the Ensemble Climate Projection Team at the Met Office Hadley Center and needs the production and evaluation of the climate simulations used for informing climate adaptation. The most recent notable set of projections are the global projections uh, for the UK CP18 program. Uh, David also developed and led the production of the probabilistic climate projections in UKCP09 using a Bayesian methodology to quantify the risk using observations and a variety of climate simulations generated at the Met Office and other climate centres around the world. In 2008, David received the LG Groves Prize for Meteorology for this work. And his co-author or co-speaker is Nick Leach, who is a PhD student had the Environmental Research Doctoral Training Partnership at Oxford University and in, is in his fourth and final year. He re, uh, resides in the Predictability of Weather and Climate Research Group, supervised by Antje uh, Weishammer and Mars Allen. His research explores the use of operational weather forecasting models within the field of extreme event attribution, with a particular focus on heat events. So this work touches on themes of numerical weather prediction, attribution of climate change, meteorological drivers of extreme weather and extreme value statistics. And our uh, responder, respondent um, is Nigel Arnell, who's director of the Walker Institute at the University of Reading and professor of climate system science in the Department of Meteorology. He was formerly a professor of geography at the head of the School of Geography at the University of Southampton. And his research interests include the impact of climate change on hydrological regimes and water resources, the impacts of climate change across the global domain, the use of climate information and adaptation to climate change and climate policy and risk assessments. It sort of feels like I should ask you all to welcome our panelists, but um, maybe not. Um, right, so this is how the program will work through. We have first the presentations and then the Q&A, uh, the respondents, and then the Q&A and discussion session. If you want to, you can post questions in the Q&A box at any time. 
Um, it's important that people look at that so they can upvote which are the favorite questions they would like to be answered because that'll tell me which ones to ask first. Um, if attendees could all remain muted unless unable to speak by the host, um, the webinar as a whole, the audio and the slides will be shared after the event. And if there are technical problems, put those in the chat. And uh, the webinar is being recorded, so I'll respond to that accordingly. Um, so these, just a few news items to go through. Um, the first is that the Adaptation Subcommittee of the climate, Committee on Climate Change is looking for three new members in these three areas, the climate change impacts facing wildlife, the natural environment and agriculture. Uh, on the economics, economics of climate change adaptation, including natural capital approaches. And the last one is climate change risks and opportunities facing key sectors in the UK, particularly business and industry. And the deadline for that to apply is the end of this month. And there's a link uh, for you to be able to do that. Um, the IPCC has also opened um, registration for the review process of the synthesis report. Uh, you can get that from that particular link. Um, deadline is to register is the 13th of March and all comments need to be in by the 20th of March. That will give you a week if you take it to that first deadline. The last one I think is the, the, just to bring to your attention that the latest UK climate change risk assessment has been released um, earlier this month, the last week in fact. Um, and this is the third UK climate change risk assessment report uh, that uh, Parliament will out be outlining the UK government's and the devolved administration's position on the key climate change risks and opportunities that the UK faces today. Right, so on to our, our, our speakers. Um, and I think David Sexton will be starting off and then we'll be followed by Nick. So there we go. Okay. Ready? Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for attending this webinar. Um, um, so the format today is that I will give a brief introduction as to the kind of background of the project and then Nick will do a lot of the talking about the analysis and then I'll come back in about the user guidance and where to get the data. Um, so Simon said, I'm, I led the UKCP18 global projections and in that UKCP18, we have a peer review panel a lot of eminent scientists and one of them Jim Hall came up to me at the end of a meeting and said to me well um, I like the idea but I think I would have you know he debated whether we've got the balance right between resolution of model which was 60 kilometer and ensemble size which um, was like 28 and he wondered whether it should have been more on the ensemble size that, so we could better sample extremes and so it got me thinking about how you would actually do both have a large ensemble at high resolution 60 kilometers and um, I started talking to Peter Watson, who was a visiting scientist. Um, he was visiting me at the Met Office, and um, he had an idea, he had an idea. He'd set up a model at that resolution on the ClimatePrediction.net system, and so we had a chat with Miles Allen and Jason Lowe, and um, we matched up with a um, ClimatePrediction.net team of um, David Wallam and uh, Sarah Sparrow, and uh, produced examples. Um, so the idea is basically. Um, in the Met Office, we're really interested to know if there are better ways, you see, of providing products um, to help support climate adaptation. And this is a proof of concept at providing multivariable, spatially, physically, temporary coherent data um, at high resolution so you can better sample very rare extremes. Um, and the really cool thing that Miles did was he said, well, actually, I've got this uh, student working towards DFIL um, and it's perfect kind of match with his project so we got Nick Leach to join the team and do a lot of the analysis so um, also uh, need to go through and acknowledge a few people other than Miles but I'd like to acknowledge Alex Chamberlain Clay and Catherine Locke um, for um, putting the data on Jasmine doing the website Zaritza Jones for her good advice on the project and I'd also like to I haven't mentioned there but I'd like to thank Kunika Yamazaki for helping Sarah out as Peter said Sarah's done a lot of work setting this up and of course, all the volunteers that helped. So uh, with that, I will hand over to Nick. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, yeah, so right, let's get into it. So just to start my talk, I'm gonna give a very quick overview 
Um, so I've split the talk into three kind of rough sections. So I'm going to start off with a description of exactly what we've done. So that's the experiment design and why we've chosen that particular experiment design. So the motivation. Then I'm going to go into probably the longest section. So that's what we found and the results from our experiments. And then finally, I'm going to go through some concluding thoughts and kind of research questions or directions that could potentially come out of this study. And so just to give the also on this slide to give the, the kind of 30 second summary of this talk. Um, so we've generated three very large ensembles using a, an atmosphere only model forced by lower boundary conditions from very extreme future winters that were simulated by a coupled model. So these ensembles explore the uncertainty surrounding these individual extreme events and can answer questions such as, could they have been even more extreme? And so the, the, the primary use that we can see for, from this work is that our ensembles contain a, a very rich set of physically coherent future extreme events that could potentially be used in, in impact studies or as kind of high impact, low likelihood scenarios. And right, then let's move on to the first kind of experiment design slide. So we started off with the, with the set of UKCP18 global projections from the, the HADGEM3 perturbed parameter ensemble. So that's the, the orange kind of time series you can see here and uh, under the RCP 8.5 high emission scenario. And so we were from, from those scenarios, we were from, or from those simulations, we look at a future period corresponding to around four to five degrees of global warming. So the, the 2061 to 2080 period. And so from within this period, we selected three of the, the most extreme UK winters, winters, so single seasons, kind of seasonal extremes. And I'll talk a bit more about how we selected the particular extremes we were interested in later. We then take the sea surface temperature and sea ice boundary conditions from, from those simulated extreme winters in the coupled model. And we use those boundary conditions to force an atmosphere only model. Um, so we run this model using the climateprediction.net distributed computing system, which runs the model on the, on the personal computers of volunteers. And so this is possible due to the, the computational efficiency of the atmosphere only model that we've used, which is HADAM4, which Peter Watson has been working on. Um, so this distributed computing setup, it's allowed us to generate very large perturbed initial condition ensembles. So we target, targeted ensemble sizes of around 1500 members for each of the three sets of boundary conditions from these extreme winters. Um, we've actually ended up with ensembles of between kind of 1200 and 1300 members. And the analysis here is based on around a thousand member ensembles that were available when I when I kind of did this analysis and, and wrote up this talk. And so in addition to these future kind of large ensembles, we've also generated um, corresponding baseline ensembles, which are over a 2007 to 2016 present day period. So there's there's one baseline ensemble for each of the three future ensembles. And so these baseline ensembles used boundary conditions from the same UK CP18 perturbed parameter ensemble member as, with, as generated the future winter extreme. And so we aim for 50 members per year in these ensembles. So 10 years times 50 members is, gives us a baseline ensemble size of around 500 members for each of the three future ensembles. And so to very briefly go over a few, a few model details. So when I refer to the coupled model or to the UK CP18 PPE, I'm, I'm referring to the, the state of the art client model from the Met Office Hadley Center used, used in UK CP18. So that's HADGEM GC38.05. And the model we've used to generate our large ensembles is an, is an updated version of HADAM4 um, described in the top two references at the bottom. Um, it's been shown to validate very well in the winter. And both models, as David said, are run at an identical horizontal resolution of around 60 kilometers. And the final important point to make is that while, while UKCP18 was run on a supercomputer, super all our ensembles here were run on the personal computers of volunteers through the, the climateprediction.net distributed computing system. And so now moving on to, to how we picked the three kind of extreme winters from which we're gonna take those boundary conditions. So overall, what we're interested in this project is the uncertainty surrounding the sampling of, of the most ex, those most extreme winters in UKCP18. So for example, could these most extreme winters have been even higher or are they kind of as high as you could physically expect to get? And so to help us kind of understand this, it's, it's helpful to separate out a few components of these kinds of extreme events. So you've got the force trend due to anthropogenic global warming, because this is a, a scenario of kind of con continued very high emissions. And then you've got contributions from both oceanic and atmospheric internal variability. 
So this top plot shows the raw time series, so the, the kind of what you get straight out of the model of winter mean daily maximum temperatures on the left and winter mean precipitation averaged over the UK on the right. Uh, so this is the 15 member UKCP perturbarometer ensemble. And so we were interested in, in hot winters. So the reason why we've got kind of hot winters and wet winters on here is because at the time we were, we were thinking about this, we kind of had the, the hot winter of 2018 to 19 and the wet winter of 2019 to 2020 and kind of in the forefront of our minds. And so the bottom plot shows exactly the same time series, but we've removed the trend. So this is an, this bottom plot shows an estimate of the, inter the, the internal variability contribution to each of these winters. So by removing the force trend, you're just left with the, the component due to internal variability. And so since we'd expect that the, the most extreme winters, so the ones circled in the, in the bottom plots, have the largest contribution from internal variability overall, we'd kind of also expect that these contain the largest contribution from oceanic internal variability, although we don't know this. So therefore, as we were kind of looking to, to sample really exceptional extremes with our atmosphere only model within, a, within these large ensembles we were going to run, we chose boundary conditions, so that's the, the ocean kind of SSTs and sea ice conditions from these extremes that are the most extreme in terms of their deviation. So in terms of internal variability, they've got the largest contribution from that. And so our expectation is that boundary conditions from these circled winters will result in more extremes than a kind of average set of boundary conditions if you just took what, any one of these years at random. Um, so we aim to run three, three ensembles and so decided to run two ensembles using from hot extreme winters. So that's the orange circled one here and the pink circled one there and one ensemble from this particularly wet winter. Um, so these ensembles will, will end up sampling the uncertainty surrounding these extremes, and it's specifically the, the uncertainty that arises from atmospheric internal variability. And so we were interested in using these ensembles to answer questions such as how important is, is the model complexity? So is our atmosphere, is our kind of less, maybe less complex atmosphere only model able to simulate extre the extremes that the, that the, coupled, the more complex coupled model was able to? Um, so how important was the influence of the sea surface temperatures and sea ice conditions for producing these particular extremes? So will our, will our ensembles be, be kind of conditioned towards producing more extremes than you just expect from, a, from any, any old kind of sea surface temperature or sea ice pattern? And the final question, which I've, I've said a couple of times, is could they have been even higher? And right now, moving on to another slide that I'm going to go over quite quickly. So this just shows information about the three winters that we picked. So we have three future winters. These are the top ones here that correspond to those extreme winters that were circled in the previous slide. And we've got three corresponding baseline ensembles. And so from now on, I'm going to, I'm going to, when I talk about these winters, I'm going to talk, use these abbreviations. So we've got hot one, hot two, wet, and then the same again, but with B at the end in the figures. And so just before I move on to kind of the results that we've got out of our experiment, I thought it'd be interesting to talk a bit about what these, the three extremes that we've selected, what do they actually look like in terms of their kind of synoptic characteristics? So the first hot winter, so hot one, it is a, a kind of mo moderate positive NAO pattern, a zonal flow of the UK. Um, there is a strong El Nino present, which perhaps interestingly is canonically associated with fewer positive NAO events. And the, sea ice, the Arctic sea ice is, is intact to some extent. Then if we move on to the, hot, the second hot winter, it's a stronger positive NAO pattern. Um, there is a La Nina, which is canonically associated with more NAO positive events. And in this winter, or in this ensemble member of the parameter ensemble, the sea ice is pretty much lost completely by, by this time. So this is in 2072. Um, and the wet winter, there's a, there's a strong cyclonic westerly flow, which is generally associated with warm and wet weather. Um, in this one, we don't really have a, a kind of phase of the NEO present. And in this one, the Arctic sea ice is almost kind of entirely intact. And right, so now if I move on to some results, so this is the probably the longest slide in the talk because I'm gonna step through the figure in turn and try and kind of try and explain all of the different features that are going on here. So, and I'm going to start with the, with the hot winters and then end on the wet winter. And so we've created this style of figure to, to summarize the results from our ensembles and highlight how they differ from how our ensembles differ from the UKCP18 PPE. Um, there is a lot going on in this figure, but our, if, all, both of the other results figures are identical. So hopefully once I've kind of explained how this, what, what all the features in this one, you'll understand the other two. And so if we start off with the, the top panel, 
which shows probability distribution functions of UK winter mean daily maximum temperature anomalies over the reference or uh, yeah. And so if we start with the, the two kind of future lines, so you've got the dark orange line that shows the PDF for the ensemble that we've generated. So which is, I, it's conditioned on the SSTs from the single extreme winter that we took the boundary conditions from. The solid light orange line shows the PDF of the 15 member UKC P18 perturbed parameter ensemble over that 2061 to 2018 period. And so here it's it's again, it's it's just like in the in the bottom panel of before, it's detrended so that we've kind of removed an estimate of the, the force trend so that it provides a more meaningful comparison of kind of both are just internal variability, although our ensemble is just atmospheric internal variability, whereas the UKC P1 also contains that oceanic internal variability. And so the dash light orange line shows where the extreme winter, so this very extreme winter, lies itself within, within the UK CP18 distribution. So this is actually the, the kind of hottest member of that distribution. So it relies right over to the right in the tail. And the black and gray curves show the corresponding baseline distributions for our examples ensemble and, uh, and the UK CP18 PP respectively. And so then if we move on to the bottom left panel, so we, in all of these figures, we've tried to use identical colors and styles for each element where possible to make it easier to kind of match between them. Um, so this is a return period diagram. So it shows the same temperature anomalies that you've got on the x-axis here, but they're on the y-axis here. But it shows those temperature anomalies against the return period. So this is when you would expect, or how often you would expect to see an extreme of the size on the y-axis. And so the, these return periods are for the, the year that this extreme occurred, so 2066. So these aren't return periods in the present climate, there are return periods in that future climate in 2066. So once again, we've got this dashed line where the, with the, the, ex, the single extreme winter from UKCP18. And so that lies at a best estimate return period of, of seven, around 700 years in 2066, which is yeah, pre, a pretty high extreme even in the future. So the black line shows a statistical distribution that's fit to the, to the kind of the upper tail of the UKCP18 members. Um, and so this, this statistical fit uses extreme value theory, which is, is a method that we can use to provide information about the probability of extreme values based on data. And so the underlying data in this case is the UKCP18 distribution. So you can see that that black line matches the, the light orange dots that are the UKCP18 samples for pretty well. And so at this point, it's, it's, it's kind of useful to, to point out that to compute these estimates of, of unconditioned risk, so these return periods, we need this UK CP18 distribution. Because our ensemble is conditioned on those SSTs, we can't kind of provide any, if we just had our ensemble, you wouldn't be able to say kind of what, a, you wouldn't be able to provide a meaningful return period because it is conditioned on those specific sea service temperatures that were used to run the model. And so finally, if we move on to the bottom right panel, so this is the like, probably the, the least kind of standard type of plot, but it should hopefully be clear with the context of the other two. So these curves are histograms of the number of ensemble members against the return period. So it's the same return period as, as was on the return period diagram. But so to, to kind of explain this, if you summed all of the bars to the, to the, of the under this light orange line, if you summed all the bars to the right of this 10 year period, you'd find the number of ensemble members that have a return period of at least 10 years. And so the nice, the nice thing about this view of the ensembles is that it makes it very clear to see whether our ensembles are sampling more extreme events than would be expected, given how much larger our ensembles are than the, the kind of 15 member by 20 years, so the 300 sample UKCP18 ensemble. And to help this, you've got these gray straight lines, which are which indicate the shape that uh, that's an unconditioned and kind of independently sampled ensemble of the size given by these gray values should follow. So basically the UKCP18 one, it's a 300 member sample and it follows that 300 line very nicely. And in this case, we see that the, the SSTs and the sea ice that we've, we've um, conditioned our ensemble on aren't really providing much in terms of kind of promoting even more extremes because our, the ensemble here is about a thousand members and it pretty much follows that expected a thousand member line if it were just another kind of UKCP18 type unconditioned ensemble. 
And so basically what we take out this figure is that we can see that the, the boundary conditions that we've imposed during for, on this ensemble doesn't really appear to have made our, our ensemble any more likely to generate extremes than the unconditioned UKCP18 perturbed ensemble. So in other words, this extreme appears, the, this extreme in UKCP appears to have been generated mainly by atmospheric internal variability and the influence of the actual kind of ocean pattern is, is low. And so I should also note that even though this experiment design hasn't made, in this case, extremes any more likely, our ensemble is still a, a considerably more computationally efficient way of, of providing samples of extreme events than the UKCP18 due to the use of an atmosphere only model and the distributed computing system. And so now if we move on to the second hot winter, so the picture is, is, is pretty different here. So we can see that unlike the first hot winter, this ensemble has been shifted towards more extreme values compared to this unconditioned UKCP18 ensemble. So this is illustrated particularly clearly in the, in the bottom right panel. So <clears throat> while in the previous slide, the, the dark examples line roughly follows the, the kind of straight 1,000 member line, it now deviates towards much larger return periods than you'd expect to generate from, from kind of an unconditioned ensemble. So if, if we had all of the oceanic and atmospheric internal variability in there. So from this, you can, you can see that there are several extremes sampled within this ensemble with return periods of over, uh, over 10,000 years. So this, this one here. And so to put this in context of a, of a UKCP18 style perturbed parameter ensemble, in order to generate these kinds of return periods using, using an identical setup to how you get the original UKCP18 perturbed parameter ensemble was, you'd need 10,000 samples. So for this, for the 20 year period we focused on, so 2061 to 2080, this would correspond to a, a, an ensemble size of 500 members, which is about 30 times more than UKCP18 actually has, because it's, uh, I mean, here it's a 15 member ensemble. So therefore, and for this winter, we find that this ensemble has been strongly conditioned towards producing extreme events by the, by the SSTs and the sea ice conditions that we've prescribed. And at least some of this conditioning is driven by the sea surface temperatures promoting the formation of, of similar circulation patterns to the one that we actually saw in the extreme winter. Um, so this is something we've looked at just very briefly um, using some, uh, circulation analog analysis. So we found that analogs of that specific NEO positive flow appear about three to four times more often in our future ensemble than the corresponding baseline ensemble. So it's, it's promoting the formation of that atmospheric flow that drove, at least to some extent, the extreme. And then finally, moving on to the wet winter. Um, so the variable we're now looking at is UK winter mean precipitation anomalies. And those are measured as the percent change over the, the level in the baseline period. So here we're using percent change, which is, which is consistent with, with what studies have done previously, because we found that HADAM4, the atmosphere model we, we've used, has an approximately kind of 20% lower average winter rainfall intensity compared to the, the coupled model in UKCP18. Um, we've looked into this discrepancy a little ourselves and found it's, it's not due to differences between the large scale dynamics of the two models, but we'll need further work to, to determine exactly why it's, it's the rainfall intensity is less, but you can, you can get around that to a certain extent by, by measuring it in terms of the percent change rather than the absolute value of kind of millimeters per day or whatever. And so again, just like the, the second hot winter, you can see that our ensemble has been strongly conditioned towards producing wet extremes. So it's, it's shifted to the right compared to the unconditioned UKCP18 ensemble. And so once again, we're generating some of the extreme winters with very high return periods of over a thousand and, and in some cases, even over 10,000 years based on this statistical model that we fit to the UK, unconditioned UKCP18 ensemble. And so, I'm going to move on from this slide because I, I'm aware that the time is running out. And so, so far, we've, we've just looked at seasonally extreme winters. So kind of these seasonal extremes averaged over the whole winter period. So before I wrap up with a, with a bit of a summary and discussion, I'm just going to touch briefly on, on sampling isolated kind of weather extremes on shorter timescales. Um, so we know that we've sampled these ex exceptional seasonal events, but have we also sampled shorter timescale extremes? And so in short, the answer is, is, is yes. So if we focus on the first hot ensemble and the, the weather extreme that I'm talking about here is, is UK mean daily maximum temperature event, so averaged over the UK. And so we find in this ensemble, there are several, several events that lie far above the hottest event in the UKCP18 PPE. 
including one. So this this dark dashed line here is is the hottest member in our in our ensemble, and this dot here is the hottest member in the UK CP18 PPE. And this dashed line is 2.3 degrees higher than the than this hottest member in the UK CP18. And so what what's kind of interesting is is you use a statistical approach to to fit a generalized extreme value distribution to this UK CP18 ensemble. You find that this specific event, so this dashed line is, is near impossible. And so you can see that why I'm saying that from the confidence intervals around that fit. So rather than a kind of a standard 90% or a 95% confidence interval, here we've got a 99.8% confidence interval. And so although, although the uncertainty is associated with this really large out, kind of out of sample extrapol extrapolation are also very large, it, it seems implausible that you'd expect to see such a hot event, even if you significantly increase the size of the UK CP18 PPE. And so there are a number of reasons why this might be. Um, so I'm not sure I have time to go over in detail here, but another interesting feature is that from a, from a meteorological perspective, um, this particular sampled event is very kind of very similar in synoptic conditions to the extreme heat wave that we, we experienced in the UK at the end of February 2019. And so what we suggest from this is that such exceptional weather events could be you could be of use for groups who are considering future e extreme impact studies or the, the kind of H plus plus or high impact low likelihood events who want physically coherent examples of these most extreme weather events. And so then to summarize what I've talked about today, um, we present a, a proof of concept methodology for generating large climate model ensembles containing many samples of extreme winters using an atmosphere only model run on the climateprediction.net distributed computing system. So we've used this methodology to generate three uh, sort of 12, 1,250 member ensembles, which sample the the atmospheric internal variability component of uncertainty that surround three of the most extreme winters that were present in the UK CP18 global perturbed parameter ensemble. And so we found it that in that the lower boundary conditions that we've taken from these most extreme winters, um, they conditioned two of our ensembles to reach towards producing more extremes, but they, they didn't condition the third, which is kind of interesting. And so our ensembles, including the unconditioned ones, though that's to a lesser extent, provide many samples of spatially, temporally, and physically coherent extremes. And so this is what we view as being kind of the key outcome or takeaway of this methodology. And so just to reiterate some of the numbers, we, we estimate that many of these extreme samples that we've got within our ensembles have return periods, which were estimated using the unconditioned UKCP18 PP of, of over a thousand years. So that, that just to uh, clarify those return periods are for that future period, they're not return periods in the present day. And so in some cases that these return periods are even over 10,000 years. And in order to expect such, such extremes to be generated with a, a UK CP18 style ensemble that we've looked at here, you would need around 500 members, which is, is kind of beyond anything that could be done. And so finally, on to, on to discuss this, this work a little bit and sort of potential uses and where we see this work progressing from here. Um, so to start off with the, with the potential use cases, um, we, in, we sort of envisage that our ensembles could be used in studies looking into the impacts associated with the types of weather extreme that I've discussed today. So kind of hot events and wet events and potentially others because um, they it, just because I focused on hot events, it doesn't mean that it's only hot extremes that are present within the ensemble. Um, and so in particular studies that require either very large ensembles or who are interested in exceptionally high extremes. Uh, might be interested in our ensembles due to the, the rich set of physically coherent extremes sampled within them. And so on a related note, another application would be for users interested in the kind of worst case limit, limits to adaptation scenario. So again, your, your H++ or high impact low likelihood scenarios and, and associated impacts. Um, so as demonstrated in this talk, we've sampled a number of events that, that lie beyond even the most extreme events in that UK CP18 global perturbed parameter ensemble. And our final immediate use case would be to, to, to support other work that has been done regarding extreme events and that might be done regarding extreme events, such as, such as validating or complementing statistical methodologies for, for constructing these kind of limits, limiting extremes. And finally, moving on to the research questions and directions that have come out of this study. So one, one fundamental question that we have following this analysis is why two of the ensembles were conditioned towards extreme and the other wasn't. 
there are clearly some, some key features of the lower boundary forcing, so the sea surface temperature and the sea ice conditions that promoted the formation of such, such extremes in two cases. Um, so if we could identify these features that promote extremes, then we might be able to more intelligently select boundary conditions that would then sample extreme events even more efficiently than the ensembles we've used here. Um, so the, here we've kind of based up what the boundary conditions that we used on the expectation that using sea surface temperatures that generated an extreme in the coupled model would be more likely to generate extremes in our atmosphere model, i.e. that there's some contribution from oceanic internal variability. And so there's, there's a study by Hugh Baker, so this, that's this one here, that did some work to, that could potentially be extended in order to just try and answer this question of how to select sea surface temperatures in order to even more efficiently sample extremes. And so another direction that could be taken would be to try and extract additional information from our ensembles through downscaling. Um, so for example, kind of catchment scale hydrological model re typically requires much higher spatial resolutions than the 60 kilometers we've got here. And so statistical downscaling of, of the available model output could potentially provide such information. And so since we've, we've shown that the Hadam 4 dynamics appear consistent with the state of the art Hadgem 3 model, and also given winter precipitations are Protect precipitation events are generally driven by large scale processes, this kind of statistical downscaling could well be appropriate. And if suitable model output were stored in the future, it might also be possible to drive high resolution regional convection permitting models, such as already done in UKCP 18, but with a potentially much larger ensemble or for specific extreme samples that were that are present in our ensembles. And finally, thanks, thanks very much for listening. And if you're interested in, in reading about this in a bit more detail, um, although we're currently revising the paper, you can read the original submission, which is available as a, as a preprint and linked to by this QR code. So, and now I'm going to hand back to David. Hi, thanks, Nick. Great. So I'm going to quickly go through how you might access the data. So first of all, Nick's mentioned his paper is in revision, um, but there's also a second paper, which Sarah Sparrow is uh, preparing. Um, the data is actually um, put on, it's already on Jasmine. At, at these, uh, these are the path names. There's uh, two data sets. There's the one, which is the full data set for the UK and the North Atlantic European sectors. But there's also a smaller set, which is just a thousand members, which is for the UK only. And that's the one that Nick used in his paper. So if you want to do some comparison of results to check you're doing the right kind of things, that's available. Uh, long term, we hope to put, put this on CEDAR. Um, there's also a document on user guidance, which has got some useful advice on making anomalies and um, explaining things like why there's different number of members in the different ensembles for the different winters. Um, I very much treat the data as exploratory at the moment until um, one of those papers has been published. And if you go next slide, please. So as again, it's a large number of physically, spatially, temporary, multiple variable examples of future extreme winters. We think it's ideal for kind of impacts that hit multiple sectors as well as single impact studies. Uh, they're very high return level periods because of this condition that Nick's explained. Notice they're not 2.2 kilometer resolution. So we haven't got all the, the full detail of the you know, precipitation changes you might expect in uh, Lizzie Kendon's kind of UKCP local projections that, um, that, that made. Um, we we would recommend using percentage precipitation change in this study. and. Um, as I said before, it's right. To start. It's a proof of concept, um, but we Met Office would really value uh, some feedback actually from anybody who tries it out to see how useful it actually is. Um, because if it actually made a product on it, it would need a little bit more develop in terms of uh, the different types of models we use and how we run it. Um, but thank you very much for listening. Well, okay, everybody. Um, in lieu of an introduction, um, thanks so much for that, uh, Nick and David. That was really interesting, fascinating example of something that I think is going to be really incredibly valuable. Um, in the interest of time, because I think questions are going to be really important here, I really just want to make a couple of points uh, about this this, this activity. Um, and the first one is to, is to step back a bit and 
point out that we've, over the last year or so, we've been increasingly familiar and aware of worst case scenarios. Um, we've heard them all, all the time. Uh, they're really important. The third CCRA that Simon Brown mentioned right at the beginning um, talks about the need to look at high impact scenarios to be able to characterize what the real risks to the UK are, are from climate change. So this is a really, really timely and important piece of work. There are really two points I'd, I'd like to make, um, really. One is that these worst case high end scenarios are, are really important. But what's really, really most crucial about them is that they're credible. Um, what do we mean by worst? What do we mean by high end? What do we mean by plausible or reasonable worst case? So getting some idea of how these things are constructed, what the, what the theory is, if you like, on which they're developed is, is really important. And related to that, they need to be constructed using some robust and, and transparent technique. Otherwise, people aren't going to take them seriously. It's just a bit like a Hollywood scare story type thing. So what's really important about this activity, I think, is that it's a, it's a really good, coherent, physically based approach to construct transparent and understandable high end scenarios. And it's going to be really interesting to see how these can be used in practice. I think they're going to be very valuable and the credibility behind them is, is really important. The second point I'd just like to make, um, just really to, to follow on from this project, is um, Nick and David both mentioned high plus plus and high end scenarios. And I just want to, to flag a project, another project within the UK Climate Resilience Programme, uh, funded through the Met Office. We're leading at Reading with um, Ivan Haig at Southampton, looking at the coastal bit, where we're aiming to create some more high end, high impact, worst case type scenarios for the UK, building on and developing from UK CP18. And we're going to be taking a range of approaches, primarily based on stories, characterising plausible changes to the way the circulation and the climate system might work. And of course, this sort of approach that Nick and David have been talking about is exactly one of the techniques that we would hope to explore in the construction of scenarios from these plausible narrative stories. So what we've heard about the influence of sea ice, for example, is, is really, really interesting in terms of the possibility of generating really extreme scenarios for the UK. So I thought it was a really good example of a, something that's really important. Um, and it's the, the robustness and the transparency, I think, are really important. And the understanding of the physical mechanisms behind the high end scenarios is, is really, really crucial for them to be taken seriously. Right. So now I think we go to the Q&A. Uh, Simon. I think we may have lost Simon. If Simon doesn't it doesn't return, then I'll lead the Q&A. Okay, right. So, um, while Simon's getting back to connection, a um, question from Pete Falloon is, fantastic work, is it possible to repeat this for cold and dry winters? Um, and would the method add value to existing data sets? So, moving beyond warm and wet to cold and dry, would it work for those sort of conditions? I do not. Uh, yes, we could use it for cold and dry. We have to be careful. Um, I think it will work for winters. Um, we, we consider doing summers as well, but Hadam 4 doesn't validate as well for uh, in summer as it does in winter. So that's the kind of main determining factor. Um, but yes, I think it would add value. And I think it would, along the lines that Nigel um, I'm very grateful to the kind of words that Nigel just said, but those kind of um, that value you would get, you would get from these data sets. Can I add a qualifier there as well, an extra question as well? Um, would it work for summer, hot and dry summers? As I said, I, I think the, in principle, the method definitely yeah. could. Um, I'm not sure whether Hadam4 um, would be capable of doing it. Yet, I mean, I think people have touched on the processes and I think it's really important to make sure that you've got the kind of right processes represented in the model to create those extremes. Um, so absolutely. 
um, that is a, a kind of pride check. And I think we need to better understand, actually, in general, our models and what we use to represent extremes and how well we capture the processes that were actually um, important in reality when they created those extremes, like the, the two that uh, Nick mentioned um, in February 2020 and February 2019. Yeah, so that plays to the understanding the physical processes and mechanisms which generate these events. And if the models, as we at the moment don't do it, then we can't use that approach. So that, that's a, yeah, that's a really yeah. good point. Um, related to that, it's a question from James Murphy, which is, to what extent does the use of the different atmospheric model complicate the interpretation of the comparison with UKCP18? So I go for that one again. Uh, okay. Well, to what extent then, does the use of a different atmosphere model yeah. complicate the interpretation of the comparison yep. with UKCP18? You, you're not using the UKCP18 model, you're using the HADAM version. Absolutely. Does that make a difference, basically, I think is... Uh, yes, it will do. I'll, I'll let Nick answer in a minute. Um, on the details uh, but yes this is a very much a proof of concept this was about seeing whether the method to kind of subsample winters and generate um, you know find a way to generate using models sort of plausible um, credible patterns of climate change across multiple variables so that people could um, put it into impact studies but yes the actual details were um, it is important. I don't know. People wouldn't have noticed, but there, there was, for example, different vertical resolutions in the two models. And that is important for connecting up the stratosphere to the troposphere. Now, um, you would have heard a lot about polar vortices and polar vortex affecting often our winter circulation. So one way um, with the, the resolution we have in UKCP18, we capture those processes um, less so, I think, in this kind of model with this reduced vertical resolution. But actually this model does very well at capturing the, the circulation types. But if we were to do this as a product, I think we'd absolutely want to uh, think really hard about trying to make, um, we'd, ideally we'd do it with the same kind of model that we used to build UKCB18. Um, but the problem is there's no way we haven't got the resource to run as many of the ensemble members as we had. So we'd have to think really carefully about how we're doing that, How what the effect is of that compromise we're making with HANAM4, but we're using the wonderful kind of climate prediction.net tool and all those thankful to all those citizen scientists out there. Okay, Nick, Nick did then, you want to add anything to that? Um, I could, I guess I could briefly touch on what we kind of did do to, to check that the models aren't behaving in completely different, different ways. So we, we did kind of check that the baseline ensembles were consistent with one another. So we, I mean, that. We didn't find any statistically significant differences in over that baseline period between the two models. No, I mean, that doesn't mean they're, they're identical. And there's defi definitely one thing that we, we kind of, ha I guess, can't answer because we've only got these single winter ensembles is we can't say that the force response is going to be identical. But I think like, like David said, it, has said, it is kind of just a proof of concept and we've done what we can to, to make sure the models aren't behaving in completely different ways. But of course, there is more that could be done to, to kind of validate, validate that it's not just because one the Hadam four model is behaving completely differently. There's, thanks. There's, there's another model related question before we start talking about some of the process related questions that come up. Um, and it's a question from Jim Hall. Um, and his question is critiques of SST forced atmosphere only models complain about the neglect of atmosphere ocean feedbacks. Does this bother you in this setup? So essentially, it's I think it's to do with the definition of the initial conditions and how far back in time you go, and yeah, is that a major constraint here? Um, I can have a go at that. So there is uh, definitely some studies out there. I think of Battisti and Basugli, um, in particular, which show that um, it's the the two way feedbacks are important um, for capturing certain aspects of the variability. Um, does it bother me? No, um, it doesn't actually at the moment. I think what I think what we're doing here is actually um, capturing a lot of the processes. I don't think those couple processes in this particular case will be um, first order. I think it, I have confidence because um, a lot of the the circulation patterns um, that we reproduce in the ensemble are, and the, the ones that actually produce the extremes are actually um, pretty similar to the ones that produce extremes in uh, the real world. Um, but it, it's a good point. And again, it goes back to process evaluation. You know, if we could 
evaluate those processes and the extent of which coupling actually matters, I think that will be add value and therefore add credibility. Okay, great. Thanks, David. Um, there's move on to some of the process questions now. And there's one from Timothy Lamb, um, which is, well, he said, great work. Um, the idea that El Nino associated warm winters are mainly driven by atmospheric processes, while La Nina associated warm winters are driven by SSTs and sea ice is interesting. Have you looked into the existing drivers, whether it works in a similar way at present, or is this a consequence of a warming climate? So it plays to the process points that you mentioned in the talk. Do you want me to go? Yeah, you go for that, Nick. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I, I say that we, we've done, I guess, I'd say we've, we've done pretty limited work on the actual processes behind that. I think so far and in the paper, we've kind of noted that, it, that this is an interesting feature that's come out is that that La Nina winter kind of did promote more of the uh, positive events, which is kind of what you'd expect canonically. But I think with these on, or at least we've, we've recommended in the paper with these ensembles that there's a, there's a limitation to what you can do because we have only got like one, we've got one specific La Nina rather than a, like lots of different La Ninas. And it, it's kind of, it would be kind of hard to really, I guess, dig down into whether that is what is, I mean, pretty, yeah, if you carry on, Dave. No, you're doing well. Um, I was just going to add that actually I was quite surprised by this result. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of good work done by our seasonal forecasters around the world, really, to show that El Nino um, can have an effect on winter. And there is predictability in winter. I, I do wonder the fact that if we, I don't, I can't remember the extent to which a stratospheric tropospheric process is important in that response to El Nino. Um, but these are the kind of things we look in, we could look into. But um, yes, um, it, it, it was nice to have both cases where internal variability dominated the response compared to one where actually um, the oceanic state actually really did condition and create the, the extreme. Good, thanks. Um, the next couple of questions are similar and they're essentially about reliability and statistics. Um, <laughs> so, so no problem there then. Um, another question from, from, from Jim is, interesting to see that the record shattering instances of physically plausible, plausible events are outside the confidence intervals for the GV fit. Does this suggest that the asymptotic assumptions of GV are not consistent with your physical understanding? And there's a question from uh, earlier on, I've lost it from the list now, about how you can characterize the reliability of your results. So uh, to do with the statistics of it. You want me to say? Um, yeah, do you want to have a go with that, Nick? From the GV fit, because I guess. Um, so I think that wasn't that was an interesting result. I think we're when I'm not super keen to make a huge amount of the fact that it's above the GV EV fit because I think that there. So I, I mentioned at the time there are a number of reasons why this could be, and we we don't know exactly which one it is. So the kind of the first reason would be that Hadam four behaves differently at the tail to to Hadam three, and we haven't kind of got a we have even with our large samples we haven't got a large enough sample of both models to to make sure that. Hadam 4 just doesn't have a really, say, like extended tail of these kind of daily time scale extremes. Um, the second kind of related reason why it could be is that the response of the tail in Hadam 4 is different. So even though we've, I kind of, we've shown in the paper that, that the baseline distributions are very similar, particularly on the, on the daily maximum temperature extremes. Um, we don't know if that carries on to how they both respond to climate change, but I think possibly kind of the, maybe the most interesting reason is that that, so that that distribution or that member that's in the ensemble that was conditioned on this singular single SST pattern is the, the yeah the final reason is that that SST pattern just has a, a much kind of fatter tail than an unconditioned kind of if you include all the different phases of variability present in the ocean that that spe specific sea surface temperature pattern and sea ice conditions do actually just promote more of these even higher events than you would expect to see from the unconditioned distribution. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't think we can necessarily say which one of those three reasons it is, but there, it's kind of, there are a number of interesting reasons for that. Well, I think Jim's point is as well, it does beg the question of whether the GV with, or, or distributions which end up with an implicit upper bound, um, 
whether there, there is a real upper bound or whether it's just an artifact of what we can simulate so far. That's, that's a really interesting point. And you know, the, the specifics of it, you can address by different distributions, but GV and bounded distributions, they, they, they tend to emerge from lots of analysis of current model output. And you know, it does beg the question of whether it's a feature of reality or, or models uh, discussed. Uh, the second question related to that was, is there any way of characterizing the reliability of um, the scenarios you've produced? Now, I guess that begs the question of what you mean by reliability and um, that yeah. might- Shall I have a go at this? So I, I can't think of a statistical way. I think that I, from what I remember reading the question, it says something about from the observations and I guess you, you could um, have a look at uh, analysis for the observations to help support that in some way. Um, Maybe Nick has comments on that, but I, I, I think I would try to um, really report credibility by evaluating the kind of understanding of the processes um, that actually are involved in the extremes in reality and in the model and and just build confidence or lose confidence, depending on how what good that um, evaluation is. But I think there are some extremes. I mean, you know, I saw a plot by Ben Sanderson the other week, which showed that the heat dome was way outside anything we'd ever got in CMIP6 global models. And you have to really question the, um, whether we got the processes in the model to capture that. Um, and then you have to realize how, you know, in some situations, actually there are some extremes at the moment we may not be able to represent um, until we get to very high resolutions. Um, so, um, but there probably are clever experiments we could do to actually get there quicker. And, uh, yeah, I think and Nick, I don't know whether you've got any comments on the use of observations. Um, I think if we're, yeah, if I expect the, the kind of reliability that Antti is talking about is, your, is the kind of forecasting based reliability. So the, the kind of free observation frequency matches the, the kind of model likelihood. Um, I say that that is one feature of what we've done that's maybe missing because we've kind of previous studies, previous work has shown that the model validates well in the winter. So here we've kind of I guess skip to the proof of concept rather than kind of going back over that. But I think that is, yeah, I mean, it's something that is important for um, drawing the conclusions that we have done here, but it's not something we've specifically done here. Okay, thanks. And that um, really sort of emphasizes that we evaluate reliability and credibility based on scientific understanding rather than some form of application of statistics to clump model output. And I think that's really quite a, a key point. Okay, all right, there's one more question in the box, but I think that's the same as a question we've already answered, so we can tick that one off. Um, I'd like to, we're right up the, the, at the end of the, the session now, I'd like to hand back over to Simon Brown. Yes, um, okay, thank you. Rebooted. Um, yes, for, sorry about that. <laughs> for summarizing the last 20 minutes. <laughs> 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 even though I missed most of the Q&A, but that's, that's fine. Um, I think there's been really interesting uh, uh, hour or so, um, showing some very new ideas and new possibilities of using um, our modeling data and how that relates to um, assessing risk from these events that are, are very rare. Um, uh, I hope it's been helpful for all those uh, who've tuned in um, and I think we probably will see a lot more work in this sort of area where we look at um, uh, events that are generated within the model world, which seem to be at the very limit or even beyond what we've seen in the observed world and trying to understand how much we should focus on those events and how much, how do we try and validate those things that we've never seen before and gain trust in them. Um, so this is really interesting in that in that debate. Um, thank you for the questions. Thank you for the answers. Thank you for the speakers. Um, I think there is just a few tidying up um, events uh, slides. Um, yes, promoting the next uh, webinars in the series. There, there are two planned jointly um, in March, the beginning of March. The first on the second is um, so they're both looking at this, the working group two uh, of the latest IPCC report. The first with speakers Mike Moorcroft, um, lead author of chapter two on the terrestrial and freshwater ecosystems, and uh, Daniela Schmidt, a lead, of chap lead author in chapter 13, titled Europe. Um, and then the following one will be, um, we'll have Lee uh, Barang Ford, 
lead author of chapter 16, Key Risks Across Sectors and Regions, and David Viner, lead author in chapter 17, Decision-Making Options for Managing Risk. Uh, and you uh, need to remind you that um, if you need to register for those, and there's a link at the bottom there uh, for you to uh, register your interest. But I think that is it. If you have any questions or uh, issues with the webinar, these are some um, places you can uh, Make contact with the team um, and that just leaves me to say thank you all for attending and thank you very much for those uh, for the speakers have a good afternoon <laughs>